without further ado let's begin our next session and this would be on silicon valley viewpoint on deep tech which is artificial intelligence iot solutions investment in cryptocurrency now let me tell you this that a year ago i invested in cryptocurrency my family member told me ki isme paise dal do bahut paise banaungi so i put money in that and, and i lost 90% of my i don't want to get there i feel horrible about it so <laughs> i'm really looking forward to the next session ladies and gentlemen and for that i am going to invite on stage pradeep who is the office managing partner west mumbai pune ahmedabad he's a part of the india leadership team and is focused on enhancing kpmg in india's market presence and client engagement he also manages several key accounts and client relationships for kpmg in the west region which covers fund houses and large corporate houses and i read up about you sir you're very good in singing too are you going to sing for us later <laughs> this afternoon <laughs> okay all right um, and uh, pradeep will also invite our speaker bb jagdish hello thank you um so you know we got off to a great start this morning by chandra and devjani don't you agree yes. yeah so they uh, you know this is a great auspicious start for us and now we'll just continue the same momentum so the 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 burden is on all of us to kind of uh, keep up the same kind of josh and momentum uh, i want to now introduce um, a very special speaker uh, uh who's a, a good friend and and a, a, a celebrity really from silicon valley he's come all the way from there his name is uh, bv jagdish so let me give you some background on bv because uh, i uh, know him i don't want to miss out on an important point so i'm just going to read out a few things uh, bv is a serial entrepreneur is an angel investor and a philanthropist and i've actually seen his philanthropy at work uh, he is really amazing uh, bv is a managing partner of uh, kaj ventures he has successfully invested and uh, guided companies such as uh, nutanix uh, which went ipo udly uh, which also went ipo arkin which was acquired by vmware and mumbai based uh, very uh, big and successful company called net magic solutions uh, which was recently acquired by ntt Uh, just to name a few so uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, you know bv jagdish can share a lot of thought about deep tech and and you know what's happening in, not only in the valley but across the world for us before founding kaj ventures uh, which uh, he served as a um, founding investor and ceo of netscaler where um, he pioneered he has pioneered many things and he, here he pioneered the application delivery and sold uh, that company to citrix for ladies and gentlemen 325 million dollars so he is he's got a lot of money to do philanthropy and served as a group vp and gm for citrix application networking division uh, before that he was a cto of exodus and way back in 1993 he helped uh, for with the successful ip of uh, exodus also which uh, Uh, i think it happened in 1998 currently is an active investor guys so he will be available after for your uh, you want to look him up uh, and serves on the board of several silicon valley startups uh, uh, including uh, uh, falconex which is a, a kind of a incubator for young entrepreneurs from us and india that can grow uh, not only in india but globally uh, he is an adjunct faculty of levy school of business scu and iit gandhinagar he is uh, as i mentioned uh, really uh, cares deeply about education and healthcare for underprivileged uh, both in us and india ladies and gentlemen please welcome bv jagdish Uh, 
find the way so I can move okay. out. Yeah. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Very good afternoon. Phenomenal. And uh, in fact, I'm going to set the stage for the speech that was given by the NASCOM president, which was pretty fantastic to talk about, you know, what India should do to really go after the next generation of the technologies rather than just being incremental. And before I start, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, this place is also very special to me. Mumbai is very special because I, even though I come from Bangalore, I came for my higher studies to Bombay. Back then it was called Bombay, back in 1978. And then I worked for a couple of companies, which is how my career actually started. A company called Bombay Electronics and then Micronic Devices. And then I went on to Silicon Valley back in 1982, uh, worked for a bunch of companies. And 1993 is when I, the inspiration that I got by working in, uh, in uh, some of these Bombay early stage companies is what the inspiration that I had, that one day I wanted to start my own company. And I, I and a partner of mine basically quit our jobs, and then we started our company in uh, 1993 which went on to become Exodus Communications, which pioneered the whole concept of internet data centers. And that's when, uh, at the end of that, is when I met uh, Sharat Sanghi, whom many of you may know, who started the Net Magic, which is also pioneered the concept of internet data centers in India, and went on to become the leader. In fact, Flipkart, which was one of the early customers as well for Net Magic, um, and it's also an honor to be with some of the very early pioneers and entrepreneurs in India and in Mumbai. Praveen Gandhi, for example, I worked with him very closely. I knew him from back the, the old Hinditron days, where, you know, back then, uh, taking representation of some of the U.S. companies and selling the products. And he had, like, most prestigious companies, Digital Equipment Corporation, Fluke, and bunch of other companies that he brought from the US into Indian market. And then Harish Mehta, whom I know for the last, what, 15 years or so, uh, really amazing to have uh, someone like him. And then Nishit Desai, who's the next upcoming, uh, really like a leader. So these are all the people. It's kind of very nice to be in the midst of uh, you know, such wonderful people here. And, Today, I thought I'm going to share with you the journey that I have seen personally myself in the evolution of the technologies and how some of these technologies have made massive impact, massive impact, right? I'll just go back, actually, even before this, I'll just go back because the disruption in technology seems to happen like every once in 10, 15 years. So if I just go back and reflect myself from the years of 1980s, right, the, the early disruption was this whole file system-based computers, which is Sun Microsystems, right? And then came the networking industry, right, which is where Cisco and so on and, other, uh, so, on and so forth came in. And then the mid-90s is when the whole evolution of the Internet started, Right, which is with this data centers and Amazon and so on and so forth. And then in the early 2000s is when you started to see uh, internet infrastructure companies like Google and so on and so forth. But then the next phase of the growth is where you, know, you see this uh, uh, Airbnb, uh, Spotify, Uber, which really revolutionized, which all leveraged all the infrastructure and and some of the fundamental technologies that were developed, right, to build some of these companies into multi-billion dollar companies, right? It's pretty fascinating. And in fact, all of these totally leveraged the cloud, which is where you get the compute and the storage, right, and the performance of that and infinite compute, infinite storage at a very throwaway price, especially as if like it's utility. You can just turn on, use the computers, use the storage, you pay for what you use, and you can just turn it off. That gave a tremendous flexibility, especially for early stage startup companies. But if you look at 
what the analysts predicted, right? Analysts basically predicted that the cloud was called as a marketing snake oil. You know, if you know the meaning of this, if you do, if you do a search on what snake oil means, snake oil is like, is like a fake thing that is supposed to solve problems, but it doesn't really solve, right? So even the experts, so-called experts, said cloud is not going to be real. When? In 2008, right? And you all know the impact of the cloud, how it has actually transformed the way how businesses are run, right? So, uh, and, and then eventually, you know, cloud computing became mainstream and was moved out of Gartner hype cycle in 2018. So what you saw in the last 15 years, the impact is this social, mobile, and the cloud, which is what actually brought a lot of these companies. Now, what are we seeing now, right? In a similar manner, you have the artificial intelligence, you have the blockchain, and you have the Internet of Things. Each one, if you read the reports, each one is such a horizontal thing, is supposed to create trillions of dollars of business. And interestingly enough, many of these things have a very important and direct effect on India. Right? I'm going to take some examples of some of the companies that are solving these problems. And all of these things, by the way, rely heavily on data. And Data is available in humongous numbers in India. Humongous numbers, right? Whether it is healthcare, whether it is education, whether it is something else. There's lots of data that's available, and data is the centerpiece of many of these technologies. So, question is, how do you leverage that, right? So, if you look at the uh, power of the three, if you bring as an example, uh, IoT, artificial intelligence, and blockchain. So if you take uh, a classic example of uh, a medical healthcare kind of an application. So we know blockchain means is essentially between lowly trusted entities, right? How do you enforce sort of a regulation? That's what blockchain is. So we'll go a little bit more into details. So we know artificial intel intelligence and we know IoT, which is the sensors. So if you take, for example, in a, a, a situation where patients who are at home, whose data, right, the measurements of the health vital signs are being continuously measured by these sensors, and this information is being uploaded into the hospitals or to the doctors, and a decision is being made to bring this patient from the home to the hospital. Somebody made the decision. Now, if all of that, through the blockchain, it's certified, meaning who made the decision, right? how the patient was asked to actually come from his home to the hospital, right? and the sensors that the person has is sending these real-time data, and the AI is making the decisions to eventually say, you know, is this a critical issue? Is this a non-critical issue? What should be done with that? So a use case like this, so we can actually take many examples, but a use case like this in the healthcare, where you bring these three together, can solve absolutely wonderful issues, especially Especially given the fact that there is shortage of doctors, shortage of hospital, uh, hospital rooms, right? So you want to make sure everything is being used in an efficient manner. So technologies like this will help, and there is also now proof or evidence as to who made the decisions to bring the patient from home to the hospital. So if you look at the recent the hype cycle, which is actually an indicator of where the technologies are heading towards. All these AI, IoT, and blockchain are all considered to be the most impactful ones 
over the next two to five years, right? So the hype cycle actually mentions this, and there are companies that are being born today to solve many of the problems. And as we all know, the IoT market is going to be absolutely like massive, $2.2 trillion or something like that. Uh, and the growth of this is uh, huge, which basically means there are going to be sensors, right, in the enterprise, there are going to be sensors in homes, there are going to be sensors everywhere for healthcare applications and so on and so forth. And question is, how do you take these sensors and what decisions you make out of that, right, is where the, the software technology comes in. AI impact on society, I've, I've never seen a technology that l literally touches every aspect of human life. Every aspect, right? Whether it's transportation, education, workplace, entertainment, public safety, right? You name it, it touches every, every aspect of the human life. And the good news is that many of the governments, including India, actually has formed strategies around artificial intelligence. Each one is different and applicable to its own guidelines, right, based on security and based on how you handle the data, the data protection, and so on and so forth. So interestingly, India also actually, uh, in 2018, June, created a national strategy for AI. One of the things that people are scared about in the uh, uh, artificial intelligence is the government surveillance. So this is a picture, if you see, basically in China, as people are wandering around and uh, you know, as soon as the face is recognized, you can actually see the government of China is obviously uh, recognizing pretty much everybody, right? So question is, is this happening just in China or is this happening everywhere else? So this is a picture that is taken from Florida, US. It's actually not very different. It's not very different. And I'm sure most of you would have, would have actually heard about the project that Google was working very closely with the government where a lot of the employees protested. They all walked out. Uh, so Google actually eventually pulled out of working closely with the government. But the fact of the matter is, even a country like United States right, has some of these technologies uh, as well. So to make this AI really efficient and work well, th this is, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of this well-known professor Andrew Ng, who is, is like the pioneer of this whole machine learning uh, technology, and, and uh, you know, he offers this course where millions of people have taken this machine learning, and machine learning is the centerpiece of the artificial intelligence. So this chart, all, basically what it says is large number of data helps to create a large neural network. And the large data you have and the large neural network that you can create, right, you, the training sets increases, and it helps to make better predictions, right? That's, that's when the, uh, uh, the data to the accuracy of your inference of this data in the deep learning actually helps. Uh, so in, um, uh, in the ingredients for intelligent automation, obviously, sense, the computer vision, Audio processing, we actually heard in the morning, uh, the voice, right, is such an important thing. And comprehending with the natural language processing and making decisions, which is the act, right, and giving the feedback. This is, these are the four uh, key ingredients for the intelligent automation. And why AI today? If you look at some of the things that we use today. If you have an iPhone, iPhone already has what is called as the iBrain. Through the city, a lot of these AI technologies have already been built in, right, as to recognizing your voice, recognizing the context of what you're saying, of many of these things 
right? It's already sort of built in. And then Google uses the artificial intelligence to do the translation. I don't know how many of you have actually used it. If you go from one country to another country, if you use this Google Translator, this Google Translator, not, you know, in the previous years, you speak something and it used to translate as is. That means it never understood the context. But today, you speak something and it understands the context and changes the sentence appropriately. So that it doesn't look like it, you know, funny thing, right, as it translates from one language to another language. So the whole context is understood. And that is because of the learning that it has gone through. And the, the, the third is the machine learning technologies, a lot of it is being open source. This is what actually gives a level playing field for anybody in the world to leverage these technologies, right, and apply to the problems that we are all, say, all facing. Uh, so, you, you, you know, the, everybody talks about this AI, ML technologies, and society is expected to be bigger than internet and mobile technologies. You saw, right, the impact of these technologies is so massive. Uh, enterprises and countries are looking to adapt AI to bring new levels. Every country, if you go and read, they are allocating like 25 to 175 million dollars, right, to start figuring out what should be our country's AI strategy. So in the enterprise, the AI opportunity is going to be big. I mean, many of us, I don't understand the consumer aspect of the, the business. I, I primarily understand the uh, enterprise aspect of it. So once again, you know, when you touch the, uh, the hiring aspect of it, or the manufacturing aspect of it, or operations aspect of it, everywhere you can apply the artificial intelligence technology. So the inhibitors, as we see it today, is one is the data labeling. So data labeling means where the source of this data is and what is this data. So, so far, this data labeling has been manually done, right? Whether this is coming from a patient, whether this is coming from a machine, whether this is coming from uh, something else, right? It has to be manually done. And that is not a scalable model. So this data labeling has to be fully automated. That means the machines have to figure out the source of this data and then label it accordingly. And labeling is very important, right? And obtaining massive training data sets. In order to train these machine learning algorithms, you need to have enormous amount of data, enormous different types of data, right? That is when the accuracy actually starts to increase. Because if, I, if I'm going to predict the future of what, it, what could potentially happen, right? Is this machine going to fail 15 days from now? For that, I need to have lots of data. And that data, as you are building my software, I need to have this training data sets. And explainability of the problem. So now, as you predict, you also need to explain. And it has to be believable, right? I mean, like, for example, if, if, you're, going to, if you're going to predict that this human being has the potential to get some sort of a cancer five years from now, or Alzheimer's 10 years from now. How do you explain this? How do you explain this, right? So translating that into meaningful explanation, because you don't want to scare people. So the last one is the learning generalizability. So the, the learning, you cannot just generalize it. It has to be for vertical applications, whether it's healthcare, manufacturing, operations, or so on and so forth. So blockchain is uh, uh, another technology. And once again, as you can see, the impact of the blockchain, it just literally touches every aspect of the business, insurance, uh, internet of things, ticketing, audit, automated stock control, supply chain, right? Where there is lowly trusted entities where transactions happen, this is where blockchain comes into picture. So you can apply the blockchain technology in areas where when a transaction happens, where there is lower trust or there is no intermediary, 
So that is when you can apply the blockchain, and I'll take you through some of the uh, examples of this. So th some of the myths about this blockchain is, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of this, Bitcoin. So everybody thinks blockchain means Bitcoin. It's not. Right? It's just one such example, uh, one such application, one such use case of where the blockchain is applied. And uh, the other things, assumptions are, blockchain is better than traditional databases, right? And blockchain's advantage come with significant trade-offs that mean traditional databases often still perform better. So that means it's useful in certain applications. So you are not replacing the traditional databases. So blockchain is particularly valuable in low trust environment where participants cannot trade directly or lack an intermediary. So the third one is about the security, right? Uh, blockchain is immutable or tamper-proof. So the advantage of blockchain is when you make a transaction, the next one that you do is on top of it. So, and the next one you do will be on top of that. So say, for, for example, when you do like a real, a real estate transaction, right? So if let's say I bought 10 acres of land, and I'm going to, after a few years, I'm going to sell three acres of that, and I'm going to keep the 10 acres. So now, the first transaction is the 10 acres between me and the seller. The next transaction that I'm selling will be on top of this, this 10 acres that I bought, Me meaning you cannot erase or you cannot tamper the previous transaction. So everything will be stored. Everything will be on top of the other one. Right? That is the biggest advantage. So those of you uh, uh, who have seen this movie, uh, Kosla Ka Gosla, right? Any of you have seen Kosla Ka Gosla? In fact, I, I was actually one of the victims of uh, <laughs> how, how I paid for a site, and then my site was given away to someone else, and we just lost the site and the money as well. Right? So, Things like that could be completely eliminated because you have evidence of how this transaction happened with the other person. Um, these are six different categories, right? Static registry, identity, smart contract, uh, dynamic registry, payment infrastructure, and others. But at the high level, Storage of static information and registry of tradable information. So, the, so these are uh, the, like this real estate thing that I took, right? That is a static information, and tradable is like a stock market. So those are the different types of applications. Obviously, there are people who believe one is right and the other one is. The fact that blockchain is a very distributed kind of technology Right? Some people don't like it. Some people think that this uh, centralized is better than distributed. Right? And uh, some people think that distributed is better than, and this is always like a cycle that goes on in Silicon Valley. Uh, so these are some of the companies that have been funding in, uh, in the blockchain. And in fact, in India also, we have some companies uh, I'll, I'll take some of the examples of that. So there is activity that's going on, right? It's not like uh, blockchain is still a hypothetical kind of a thing. So there is a lot of activities going on, and the well-known investors are investing, and well-known corporate investments are also making investments into uh, the blockchain kind of companies. So we'll take some examples of uh, uh, some of these. This company, Zebi, is a India and Hyderabad-based company, uh, and, and you know, they solve some of these issues related to uh, land. In fact, throughout Andhra Pradesh, the, the new Andhra, right, uh, the lot of the land transactions, in fact, happen through this Zebi platform. So to avoid the things that I just mentioned, where misrepresentation of uh, the transaction could be avoided. So this Zebi is actually the platform that is being used for land transactions, so that it's being already implemented. But on top of it, right, 
It also solves this whole fake education degrees. I'm sure many of you must have heard of uh, uh, this fake university that many of Indians got trapped into. So things like that you know, could be very easily av avoided because easily one can create these fake degrees. And there is no evidence, right? There's no proof point. I can create like a fake degree from some university and I can use that to get admission in the US universities. But with this, you go through this blockchain and university now is authenticating the fact that this is truly my degree and then anyone else uh, gets the real certificate from this centralized place. Uh, data regulations, you know, we, are, we know about this GDPR. Europe actually has uh, enforced uh, and uh, uh, the data protection rules alone cannot solve the problem as they still are created and enforced by humans and are prone to be broken. So what is actually needed is technology to enforce the rules without human intervention, protection from malicious insiders tampering with the data, right? So it's, it's kind of uh, this whole data protection aspect of it uh, is a collaborative effort. It's not just through the technology, right? So the various applications need to be protected, and everybody in the whole ecosystem need to work uh, for this whole data protection thing. Um, so this Zebi, you know, these are all the various applications, the health records, uh, property records, transaction records, right, employment records. So these are all the various applications that you can do using a platform like this. The next one is in the industrial. So this is a company based out of Bangalore, a company called Flutura, which is solving the problem for industrial IoT. So large equipments that are potentially that can fail when you run for a, a continuous period of time, if I can actually collect the data continuously, and if I can predict that this machine could potentially fail. And you know, as an example, I mean, that's not a problem that these people solve, but we can actually apply similar technology. You know, as an example, many of us, we sit in a plane, and a lot of times, the plane is delayed. It's delayed because there is a mechanical failure. There is some issue with the plane, right? It's not uncommon, you lose, and people are frustrated because, you know, I mean, like today I was coming for this. If my flight was delayed by two, two and a half hours, I'm toasted, right? So the way to solve that is you apply these kind of technologies and you collect the data from these machineries continuously and then start figuring out what could potentially go wrong. So that's the kind of problem this uh, Flutura is solving. And it's, it's remarkable to see the kind of uh, industries that they are touching, very large equipments where you collect the data and then Futura has the ability to uh, go and, and proactively tell when and where the failure could potentially happen. This is another company. This is a uh, Silicon Valley-based company called Peritus. And this company is addressing the problem in uh, the operations area. So there is a lot of data that is collected from the customer service kind of uh, application. So it, the customer service application right, is selling a lot of stories about what the customer is going through. And this company has the ability to do natural language processing and apply the artificial intelligence to the data that they collect from this whole customer service uh, application, and then start figuring out, you know, what should the company do to address the customer issues? Pretty fascinating. And this is another company also based out of Silicon Valley, again, based on uh, what the NASCOM president was talking about, uh, how important the voice is, right? So not everybody speaks English, and there is a lot of emotions associated with my speech. So for example, um, 
you know, when you, when you make a phone call, customer service uh, phone call, the operator on the other side is listening to the, is, is basically listening to what you're saying. And many times, right, these conversations are actually recorded. So what this product does is recognizing that voice and translating that into you know, English. That's a very simple thing, that everybody does that. But understanding the emotions in that conversation. Is the customer happy? Is the customer upset? Right? A lot of these things can be read through these emotional aspect of the conversation. And that's what this company actually does, which is pretty fascinating. And very interestingly, they're seeing applications like uh, uh, in, uh, in this Wall Street quarterly calls, right? So these hedge fund Wall Street ma managers are coming to this company, and they are giving the whole call conversation that happens between the CEO, CFO, and the Wall Street guys. Right? The presentation is made for 30 minutes, and the in the next 30 minutes, you have these question and answer sessions between the CEO, CFO, and the Wall Street guys. And during that time, any emotions that are expressed, right, which is sort of indicative of what the next quarter is going to look like, or the future quarters are going to look like. So it's pretty fascinating that this company is, is getting the data from the previous quarters, and they're asking them to do analysis, and they're predicting right, how the CEO behaved, how the CFO behaved, and what happened the following quarter. So pretty fascinating. Uh, and the same thing can be applied in uh, call center customer service applications. So uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a slide created by uh, my son, both my sons are doing their PhD in uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning applied to you know, many fields. So it's kind of interesting uh, that the observation, if you look at, you know, I mean, all of us have heard of this uh, automated cars, right? Driverless cars. Driverless cars is one of the applications that everybody talks about. So the question is, somebody did an experiment on a stop sign, did they put some of these signs? You saw, see those black spots? And the technology actually got confused. And instead of stopping, the car actually accelerated. <laughs> right? So, and then you have these ethical concerns, and you know, people are uh, uh, crossing or whatever. You know, there was an incidence of how Uber hit a, a, a pedestrian. So, as the technology is advancing, obviously there is a lot of sensors that these automobiles have. And uh, when you uh, uh, move so aggressively to the next level, right? so some of these fundamental issues will pop up, which essentially means, number one, it's going to take a long time. Number two, you cannot actually apply these technologies directly on the main road. So you have to find other applications, like golf cart applications or within university campuses or so on and so forth, right? So this is where the product market fit would be. Otherwise, it would be like the Google, uh, 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 Google Glasses, right? You saw Google Glass. I mean, Google, despite the fact that they invested billions of dollars, the product actually didn't go anywhere because there was a product market fit, which is, which is one of the most essential things. So let me just finish this. Uh, The other futuristic kind of things would be, you know, how to learn from the brain. So, so this is, uh, these are some of the research work that is going on. Uh, you type the thinking, meaning whatever I'm thinking, if that can be read, then the typing starts to happen. So which means for blind people, right, so you can take that and attach those solutions and translate that back. So, so this whole thing becomes like a loop. I mean, just like how you read from the brain, which you can take from the uh, computer, and then you take the computer, and the brain actually can read so that the blind people can start to see what, what 
is happening in the real life. So obviously, these are all applications that are 10 to 20 years uh, ahead, and data is obviously you know, the new oil, and AI is the new electricity. So the market is changing as well. If you look at this slide, from 2001, the top market cap companies to 2016, 18, actually, these are all the same companies. How uh, the digitization and the and uh, you know the next generation of companies, right, are the ones who are dominating with the market caps, and uh, this will continue to grow because because the software industry and all of this is making a tremendous impact on on mankind. So. Conclusion is this is a fascinating area, uh, and combining multiple technologies, you know, it adds to the complexity. But in India, as I said, there is a lot of data available, and how do we leverage this data to create applications so that we can at least dominate in some of these next generation and evolution or markets? Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah, so um, BV, that was fascinating. Uh, I think um, we all talked about AI, blockchain, uh, but you know, you, you gave some real life examples. There's a friend of mine who works in Oxford uh, University, the research center, and they talked about this company, the exact company you're saying, you know, the blind people will be able to see. So it's, it's uh, you know, limitless kind of possibilities that are there. It's huge, huge. You know, it's huge, yeah. you know. Is, is uh, Vivi's mic on too? Yeah, okay, it's on. It's thank on. you. So I just, uh, just um, uh, we, we are really kind of uh, running, uh, or we need to run on schedule, so we, we would really like Vivi to go on, and uh, you can ask a lot of questions, but unfortunately you don't have that much time. So I can take two questions from the audience, and um, uh, after that, uh, Vivi will be available. Uh, yes, yes. Right? Yes, yes, uh, yes, so. Here easier through to rest of the today at least. So, you know, yeah. catch, catch hold of him, especially that $320 million that you, you <laughs> made on that. Thank, thank you. So, uh, maybe Nishit Bhai has a question. I'll take one question from him, but then I'll, I'll come yeah. here. Uh, maybe I'll make it three questions. Don't worry. And I can't see the, there's no light here, so I don't know if any hands are raised. Okay. I'll try. I Maximum can come, three I can questions. Come near. You can. Yeah. Who is going to give? Uh, Ah, Nishit, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll repeat the question. Okay, great. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited with your presentation, first of all. Only thing I'm thinking, how would the whole technology get abused by the governments or some vested interest? Because this is the biggest concern, as you say, surveillance and stuff like that. But the, is somebody working on looking at ethical issues and the abuse? Because if, I, I don't want to talk about like, but the Nazis or stuff like that, they can classify entire class and uh, hit on that. I think those kind of, now we, we need to really look at, as uh, Vivek Vadva said about uh, driver in the driverless, right? Yeah. So we need to now also look at those issues, otherwise suddenly, uh, you know, you look at Cambridge Analytics or Facebook lost your whole thing. Uh, so social issues are getting very important, and yeah. just if some some idea about uh, no, I think if somebody is working on the. I think, um, I think this is a natural, natural challenge, right? When uh, brand new technologies move very aggressively, uh, people have not thought through the negative implications, and and if you just apply pure capitalism, that is when a lot of these things could be abused, which is basically what we saw in the. 2016 elections, uh, how in the US, right, and even in India as well, the Russians and others put up all kinds of advertisements on Facebook and Google, YouTube, and so on and so forth. So um, I th I, this could be an opportunity for entrepreneurs, right, to figure out, you know, uh, how uh, th these companies uh, and, uh, and the government are not actually abusing. So somebody could have like a red flag that pops up, which indicates the violation
between what the government is supposed to do to what it is doing today. So that could be an opportunity. Or, uh, you know, something like what happened at uh, Google, right? Employees not happy, and they took it upon themselves to go and protest to warn the company that what they're doing is not right. Thank you. One, one question here. You can tell I can repeat the question. question is like uh, when we are protecting, uh, rather projecting the cyber law, data protection law, we always say India doesn't have data protection law. But if you're looking, we are always saying a GDPR is there, data protection bill is under the process of getting enacted. But currently we have a couple of provision like a D IT Act uh, deals with a section 43A and guideline along with 72A and there's, in say it's there, uh, law is there, yeah. but it's not implemented. And, and people always think we are Maybe, missing a data. Make it short yeah. the it's question. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think uh, you're right. See, law is one thing, but ultimately somebody has to follow, right? I mean, even when we see uh, on the streets of India, there is a law that you got to follow the lane. But who follows the lane? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, implementation of the is flawed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Just last question. From here, just uh, keep it a question, not comment. Yeah, yeah, please. This is Himanshu. Uh, this is regarding uh, you talked about data labeling and explainability and data test what? data. You talked about data labeling and test data. Labeling, right? yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, any comment on data quality? Because we f face that issue of you know data quality pretty much in everything that we do. Yeah. So, uh, how do you compare data quality issues across yeah. countries? Like so, the data quality is, is a big concern as well. Um, that's why the source of the data is being filtered now, right, as to where the source is coming from. That is, a, that is an important thing, especially during the training aspect of these modules. The quality of the data is very, very important, right? So uh, how do you get a, a better quality? And then I think what will happen over a period of time, the algorithms will develop to filter out the bad quality data versus the good quality data. I think that could be an opportunity as well. In fact, uh, I myself, I'm talking to a couple of these entrepreneurs, right, who are trying to figure out how to, uh, how to provide a better quality data, that's number one. And number two, how do you provide uh, data protection, like, like especially a DNA, right? DNA says everything about a human being. So when, the, when I give a DNA to a service provider, how do I guarantee that my DNA is not going to be like distributed like what Facebook did, right? By selling my uh, profile to other people for their benefit to give me, give targeted advertisements, right? So now, you know, based on these laws, uh, there are entrepreneurs who are actually starting companies where this data protection uh, is guaranteed. That means if, if let's say I'm a 23andMe, and all that I'm doing is just uh, genetic information, that's all they should be able to see. They should not be able to see you know, diseases or other kinds of stuff that I may potentially have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivi. Big round of applause. Thank you so much. To GV. Thank you. Vivi, thank you very much. I request Pradeep to felicitate Jagadish. Thank you so much, Thank Jagdish, much. for that session. I request you to be on stage. Can you do it quickly? Ladies and gentlemen. We shall have one more session, and after that, we'll break for lunch. And the next session is how to start small and become a biggie. Thank you so much.